and welcome to the next chapter of Introduction to Programming. So now we've seen what variables, what statements are, we've seen the loops last time. So now let's go to the most important part of object-oriented programming, which is data structures. Now what we're going to see today is arrays, and to make sure what an array is for or what it could be used for, I'm going to start with a little example. And this example is going to, in the end, um, be a game, the game of life, which is not really a game, it's a cellular automa automata that was invented more than 50 years ago by the mathematician John Conway in Cambridge. And I think this is very fitting uh, for this particular exercise. So let's start first with um, an example, a programming example, and let's call it life.cpp. And we're going to start completely from scratch so we can see again, you know, that we have to start with who made something. So later on we'll see who uh, made this. And our description, we're going to say what we want to do with this particular um, piece of code. So we're going to eventually uh, implement the game of life. Just like last time, we're going to use the ncurses library which is a C library, that's why we have the .h there, and we're going to create an executable, so we'll need a main function that eventually returns something back to the operating system. There we go. And as we've seen, we need to start the ncurses um, by saying we initialize the screen with the initial init screen function. Um, there are some other things we could do now, but let's uh, keep it to that. Um, and at the end, so when we return um, to the console, which is this thing over here, we basically um, create the end win, uh, or we basically use the end win function. So we close our window again. So we basically init, initialize our screen over here and, and go back to the console over here. And in the meantime, what we're going to do is we're going to, control C, uh, we're going to ask for user inputs just like we did last time. So we have our character that we initialize as zero where we have um, user key inputs. So if the user presses a particular key, that key is stored in uh, this variable C over here. Um, and the way we do this, or we, we're going to do this, is as we've seen last time, we have this function get character, which returns uh, the value of the key pressed, get key pressed by the user, and we do this in a while loop. And we test in this while loop as long as C is not equal to the Q character, we just keep on going. Oops. Right. So this loop keeps on going and going and going until the user eventually presses a Q. When this is uh, the case, then the while loop is not executed anymore and we return to the console. Right, so we can save this and see if we made any mistakes. So we can compile this, create the executable, we call this live. And as we see last time, ncurse is a library that we need to link um, together with our executable. So that's what we'll do. Oops, we have an error right here because we need two slashes. There we go. And I think that will be it. So let's clear again and let's Compile again. Okay, that works. And if we now execute live, we basically have now our window that we can draw upon. We can type any uh, character. Once we press a Q, we return back to our original window. Great. Now we're going to see the power of arrays. Now I want to draw something on the window and I want to draw quite a bit for it. Now in the beginning, I want to, for instance, draw a dot on every location of the screen. How will we do this? For this, we can use a particular data structure called an array. And to contain this dot, I can use a character. So we have a one byte 
uh, piece in our memory that then stores what should be uh, printed for instance, but we need this for the entire screen. So if our screen over here, I would estimate it's about 30 by 30. So 30 times 30 is 900 uh, characters we will need here to display this entire thing. Now this we can do in an array. We could say our screen, our current screen for instance, so let's call that C screen, um, is 900 characters long and then later we can use these nine characters in one way. We can um, deal with one character um, like this. We can basically say C screen um, and we can have a loop for instance I equals and then we can set it to zero or we can set since it's a character to a character of a dot for instance. So this is a nice way of dealing with things that belong together. We have our entire screen in the screen we just iterate with this variable and we can create for our entire screen lots of dots. Now the nice thing that we're going to see today as well is that you can do this in multiple dimensions. So we don't have to do this for all 900 characters over on the screen but we can for instance look at the amount of lines that we have and the amount of columns and could do this like 30 by 30 and could say then that um, the i'th line and the j'th column needs to be a dot. And since we have our n curses here, we don't need to provide this 30, but we can just say the amount of lines that we have to our availability and the amount of columns that we have to our availability. Um, and that way we basically create here a data structure with, for instance, 30 lines and 30 columns that holds 900 or about 900 characters that we can later define or set to any character that we want. And as I said, this is what we're going to define now as our current screen. There. And this current screen we can already set immediately to the beginning uh, to, certain, to a certain number. In this case, I'm going to set it to a number zero. And to do this, we have to use a for loop, as I said. So first we have to have our for loop of our, for instance, j. This is an integer, we need to sh show this, as we've seen last time uh, when we saw the first time for loops. We say j is smaller than our amount of columns, for instance, and then we increment j. Then we have our for loop for our variable i, our control loop, uh, variable i, i is smaller than lines, and we increment i. So now we set our entire uh, set of characters, which is about 900, we set all of those to zero right over here. All right, so let's also say what we do here. So we initialize our screen. There we go. So when I want to display this particular screen over here, um, we can do it over here. We say we display the screen. We can do this by using this particular data structure. So we're going to do, again, this for loop over here. So let's copy paste that right over here. So for our entire for loop, Let's create curly brackets now, so that um, we can have a bit more control later on. So for our entire screen, screen we display it. There, we indent a bit better. And uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to test. If those are zero, then we're going to print, for instance, a dot. So say if um, current screen on position i and j equals zero. Um, what we're going to do then is we're going to um, use a, we're going to print right there the character dot for instance, that's what I, I was going to say. And further we can use an encurse function called move at character. That means we're going to move first to the position i, j, and then we're going to print the character dots. 
And if this is not the case, then we're going to print something else. So if uh, we have something there, if, the, if we have uh, a one there, for instance, then we're going to add, add position ij a big X there. So we can display this thing the way we want it. So we initialize our screen over here. Everything is zero. Um, let's put the initialization of n curses a little bit higher. Like here, for instance. Um, here we have our screen. And here we're going to initialize some, um, some cells to one of our screen. So we say C screen, just like we did over here, but we are going to specify some particular screen. So for instance, um, position three, four, we're going to put a big X there. Right. So in this case, if we compile, oops, oh, I made a mistake here. So that should be an I. So here I copy pasted this. Sometimes copy pasting is definitely not the right thing to do. Let's try that again. There we go. We execute. We have dots everywhere apart from our X over here, which is at position the fourth line, um, the third line, so 0, 1, 2, 3. So the fourth line really, but at position 3. Um, and the column is 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's where we placed our X here. So this way we can draw something here on the screen, for instance. And remember, we're still in this while loop here, where we displayed our screen, and at the end, we basically are now waiting for a key pressed by the user. If you press particular keys, anything is going to happen, because it's constantly redisplaying the screen over here and waiting for our next input. If we press a Q, we get back to our original command line or our, our terminal. Right, so this is something that we can later then uh, improve with uh, the game of life. Now what we're going to do first, however, is we're going to add a little bit of color. And for that, we're going to do or see something that we already saw last time as well, which is we're going to um, enable color by saying start color. Uh, atomization of curses, so enable colors, and we're going to initialize a couple of uh, color pairs. So, for instance, we have our pair one. So, we've seen that uh, from the end curses, we start at one for our color pairs. We say that the uh, default one, for instance, is the foreground color is green, and the background color is, for instance, black. So not white as we have it there, but black. There we go. That is the first one. Um, the second one is going to be color pair two. And there we're going to do, for instance, something completely different. We print in blue and we have the background in um, green, for instance. So then we could use um, for uh, ones in our cell. And this is for the zeros in our cell. So in that case, and this is where it pays off to have these curly brackets. We basically first, uh, we not only have um, where we print something, but we change the attributes of what we print uh, to our color pair. And our color pair in this case is um, for if we have a zero, so nothing, then we use color pair one. And we're going to do this over here as well, but we use color pair two. So in this, ca this case, we have a little bit nicer colors to work with. Let's see if this worked. Right, so we have basically green dots when everything is zero. And we have uh, a blue X on a green background when everything is one. Let's change that color a little bit. Instead of green, we could go for blue, for instance, to make it a little bit there. So let's go out of this, compile it again. Right, now we have a nicer color. So we have something uh, inconspicuous where we can still see where the cells are 
And if we have a cell that has a 1, it is really uh, visible where it is. Okay. Now let's see a little bit more about Conway's Game of Life. Because in Conway's Game of Life, we have a particular patterns that we can um, have here. And let's start with a particular pattern called floater. So we're not going to, we're going to initialize to one, but um, a floater is written this way. And a floater has just a few cells turned that are in the neighborhood of each other that are turned to one. Um, and in this case, we're going to turn them to one. We're not going to turn uh, get them to X. Um, although this, of course, worked here as well. And we're going to just have five cells in total. So three, four, three, five, and three, six are initialized to one. And um, one, five is initialized to one. And two, four is initialized, uh, two, six is initialized to one. And this is a particular pattern. We can show now what this looks like. There we go. This, there we go. Now we could have multiple of those type of patterns, and we're going to give them a type of behavior with game with the game of life from Conway. And the way to do this is here. This is all what we're displaying, but we're going to go and change this screen according to some very basic rules. And for this, we're going to create a second screen because we have the current screen. We're going to now also add the next screen. as a data structure. And also this is going to be um, a, a data uh, type, a set that can hold characters for the entire screen, or ones and zeros in this case, for the entire screen. We could have used here Booleans, by the way, um, but it doesn't matter that much, and I think a character is just as good. And we're going to also initialize that particular screen. So let's add here a compound set of statements after the seconds and say also that the next screen is by default zero in initialization. There we go. And we initialize both screens in that case. So we're going to copy all the content from the current screen into the next screen according to some very basic rules. And then we're going to say that the next screen um, or that the current screen should be the next screen afterwards. So we switch between the two screens all the time. So the floater is currently in our current screen. We can display it. And then after our displaying, we're going to um, use the rules of Conway's game of life. Or Conway's life is another way of um, saying it once. Well, Game of life still fits. There we go. And also there we're going to use two for loops to start uh, looking for each and every cell. So let's copy and paste those over there. There we go. Now for each and every cell we're going to do this, we're going to do this mostly for the border cells that start at zero uh, at 1 and go to lines minus 1 and call minus, ones, minus 1. So we're only using this for the cells that are right in the middle of our screen but not the ones on the border because that would take a little bit more effort which we're not going to do today. Oops. There we go. Now for those cells we're going to count how many cells are around this particular cell. So we start with this cell on 1, 1, and then with the next cell on 2, 2, and so on. And for this cell, we're going to count all the cells from here to over here. So all the neighboring cells, so to say. And for this, we're going to use um, a variable called lives. Oops. Let's go out of here. We have a variable called lives which we basically set to zero. Um, and then we're going to see how many neighbors are alive. And alive in this case is uh, if they have a one in their cell. If the cell is filled with a zero, then that cell is dead. So to, in order to be able to use this 
We also have to use an integer here called alives, which is a variable that uh, holds the number of alive cells for a particular cell, around a particular cell, to be more exact. So these alives are zero, and then we're going to use uh, two more for loops. So let's use for that x and y as, uh, um, as a counter, so to say, where x starts from i minus 1, so the, the cell before the current one, and x should be smaller than i plus 1, or equal, we can also say. So basically, we start at i minus 1, we stop at i plus 1 to get uh, the cells before and after the current cell. Um, and then we increment x. There we go. That is the first for loop. The second for loop is one where we're going to do the same thing, but then for the j, so basically for the columns. Uh, yeah, for the columns. So we have our y variable, which is set to j minus 1 y we uh, stop with y when y is smaller or equal than j plus 1 and we have here our increment again so now we have here four nested for loops which is quite a bit um, but i think this is the way to be able to count how many cells are alive because we're going to count for a particular uh, cell that is on position i j all the neighbor cells. So we're going to do i minus 1, j, i, j, i plus 1, j, and so on for uh, the both lines and the columns. So we're going to uh, test for all nine cells in that case, um, whether they are alive or not. And if they are alive, or whether they are alive, we're going to just count that um, to, uh, to a life over here. Um, and we can use here the fact that uh, c screen is 1, uh, for cells that are alive and zero for cells that are uh, dead. So we can basically say alive equals alive plus and then we have our current screen cell at position x and y. And this will mean that we here sum up all the ones that are neighboring ourselves, including the current cell, of course. Um, so in the end, once we're done with all this with this for loop, we'll just have to subtract from that our uh, current cell. So we do lives equals lives minus, and then current screen screen. There we go. And the current screen in this case is on i and j. If this current screen is zero, nothing happens. If this current screen is one then we'll see that. Now we've seen that we can shorten this over here. So we could have said plus equals. Also here, minus, minus equals to make it a little bit shorter and nicer to read afterwards. Um, but this way we have this at, the, at this point in time, an alive variable which counted how many neighbors around the particular cell are alive. And now we use the, the rules that, we are, that are necessary. So the first rule is um, if we have, and this is two things that we need to test, if the number of cells around the particular cell R that are alive is less than two, so one or zero, and if um, the current screen at position i and j um, equals 1, then what we're going to do is that the next screen at position um, i and j will become 0. And this basically means if we have in our uh, cells uh, uh, around our current cell less than 2 that have a 1, and we have our current cell being a 1, then the next time our cell will become a 0. 
So from an alive cell, we go to a dead cell. So this is one. Else, and then we have our next if statements. If the alives are uh, bigger than three, let's expand a little bit and make a bit more space here for our um, for our tests. And there we go. And if our current screen is one, so if we have a cell that is active, so i and j, uh, the the cell at i and j equals one, so it's it's alive, so to say. And we have, oops, I stopped one too much. There we go. Um, and uh, we have more than three cells around our cell that have also a one then our current cell in the next screen dies out. So in that case, we turn that one to a zero as well. And in the final rule, is if we have exactly three cells that are around the cell um, alive or containing a one, and our current screen at i j equals uh, with zero. So if it is not alive yet, um, then we say that our next screen will become alive. So next screen at i j return to one in that case. There we go. No. Make this a little bit nicer to read. Give a bit more space here to our screen. So these are the three basic rules that we have. So depending on if our current uh, pixel on our screen or the current character on our screen is one, then if uh, less than two or more than three cells are alive, then we let that cell or we change that cell at exactly the same um, position on the next screen to zero. If a particular one is zero and it has three um, neighboring cells that have a one, then that one becomes a one. So that is what the basic rules of Conway's Game of Life are. So we count how many cells are alive and we just uh, execute those particular, that particular set of if-then tests. Now the one thing that we still need to do is we need to, at the end, um, change from the next screen back to the current screen. So once we've now changed our next screen, we basically have again this uh, dual for loop, like we have here for displaying the screen, for instance. So let's take that over here. There we go. And we, we say uh, copy the contents of next screen to current screen. That means all the cells from next screen will become the cells of current screen at exactly those locations. So what we have here is uh, that um, our current screen at position i, i, j is equal to what is on next screen, i, j. And that's it. So there, um, there's not more that we need to do. In this case, we have copied everything from one screen to the other. Now, this is necessary here because if we would copy within the current screen, we would alter the contents that uh, we would need in the end. Um, you can try this out yourself at home. Let's first see if this compiles. Oops, we have an error because we somewhere put a Z right here instead of a Y. There we go. Let's start again and see whether it compiles now. No, still not because we have alive instead of alives. I'm a bit distracted today. Let's see whether it compiles now. Yes. And if we uh, execute, 
what we have is now a floater. And if we press a key that is not Q, so it won't quit, it will basically use those rules to copy and see what happens. Oops. What I was hoping to happen is that the floater would move, but somehow this, is not, this did not happen. So I have somewhere an error. Let's see where that error might be. So we have our lives here. We copy everything where it's necessary. Ah, I see. So we need here the other case, of course, because otherwise um, everything will die. So these are the three rules of Conley's Game of Life. However, if none of those above are happening, then we just keep things the way they are. So that is also something that needs to happen. So otherwise, the next screen at IJ is staying exactly the same. That means we need to copy exactly the contents from the current screen at INJ. Right. And this should make our floater float. So even we didn't, the fact that we didn't tell that floater how to move and where to move this about, it just does so with just these couple of lights. Now this way, you can have lots and lots of uh, type of symbols that you use. Let's try a couple of others. So a floater is uh, quite interesting, but um, more interesting is an explosion. And for an explosion, we use these particular um, uh, cells and this particular pattern of cells that I will just type in now. Right, so now I have an explosion um, pattern, hopefully. Let's see if that works. So we compile. And it's, now we have over here an explosion that if we use it, it doesn't float around. It gives a, a little bit of a bigger pattern. It grows. And what we can do now is we basically combine those two. And that way you can see that we can really do very complex things with just those two or those three that we saw, very simplistic rules. So as soon as we now recompile and run the game again, we have a floater, an explosion that now stays quiet, but the floater is now going to the explosion and starts now a chain reaction, which makes lots of things move around on the screen. There. Now, the type of the screen or the size of the screen really also dictates here how much is going to happen. Now, with the colors, we can also do a lot more as well, of course. We can, with the colors, for instance, signify when um, cells have lots of neighbors or less neighbors, and according to that, we can create a lot nicer routines. Right, so now let's uh, compact this piece of code here and merge the display and Conway's rule of game rules. So we, in this case, have our uh, total set of, um, of, of characters. We leave the border the way they are, the borders the way they are, and here we basically first count uh, the neighbors with a one. That is basically what is happening over here and only the neighbors, that's why we subtract again the current one. And then here we use the actual use the rules. Over here. And we can at the end display exactly that again. Right here. So here we display um, the contents of the current screen. 
all in one loop. So we don't have to do this twice as we did here. So we can just copy paste this here over here. So we have one gigantic um, set of rules here. So our uh, one nested loop where we first count the neighbors for every cell. Then we use the rules of Conway and then we display the contents of that cell, depending on um, what that cell holds. Now we could here say if the screen is zero, then we just print this dot as we've seen it already. Else, we can also look at other things. For instance, if the sc screen is one in that case, we can just check if the alive neighbors, so if the alives is, for instance, bigger than two, then we can uh, create an, a particular extra pair and otherwise we can do something completely else again uh, it's completely different again so if their lives um, well, in that case in any other case we can do something else so the green ones we put when their lives are really uh, larger so if you have three neighbors and in another case when you have uh, less than three neighbors in that case um, the cell is likely to die again, we go for another color pair. For instance, where uh, we use red to signify that this might be pro problematic in the next iteration. And also there we uh, type something, we can um, put the character as a small x, for instance. All we need to do then is add this color pair to the top, right here, where we're going to say the background is in red, for instance. And we could put I don't know, yellow uh, in the middle of the, of the cell, right? So let's see what that does now. Let's make the screen a little bit bigger so we can see a bit better what happens. So we're going to compile that. Oops, I seem to have been a little bit too excited about the T's here. Right, or R, one R, two one, too many. There we go. And that should do it. Let's try to compile again. That works. Let's execute. There we go. So now our photo looks different, of course, because we have these new types of colors. So this particular one will definitely die, as we saw. Um, and if we then keep on pressing keys here, You'll see that our explosion looks a little bit more like an explosion pattern. And as soon as our floater merges with the explosion, we have lots of things happening over here. Right. And that's it for our uh, Conway Game of Life. And let's now start with the actual slides.